this will start the formal portions of the lecture series. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview. So, uh, what's the idea behind intelligent propulsion systems? Is to increase, uh, or have a multifold increase in propulsion system affordability, capability, environmental compatibility, performance, reliability, and safety. So all those goals are there. Uh, one way to bookkeep is what do you mean by intelligent engine? So you know, so we kind of, from a controls and diagnostics perspective, you can divide it up into three parts. One is active component control. There's passive design of components, and you have to make a lot of trade-offs in the passive design. The idea is if you could actively control the component, such as active stall control for compressors, if you could operate the compressor safely beyond the passive stall region, then you can get more efficiency. Active control of combustors is another issue where you have, in the commercial side, there's a lot of focus on low emissions combustors. And low emission combustors tend to have thermal acoustic instability, which you need to really control to be able to operate at low emissions. So that's the part of the area we call the active component control, which you would hear more from Wolfgang about, right? The other part of the area is health management technologies, where you have more diagnostics and new life usage monitoring. The third part is distributed engine control and robust control, and we will talk more about all. So we will kind of talk about these three areas in our in our presentations. So why are we doing this? Well, we have two objectives. One is to help the customers understand the state of the art. Customers are your basically the, for NATO it's the buyers who buy the, the weapons, uh, buy airplanes, gas turbine engines basically. We need to let them know what technologies are available that can meet their challenging performance and operational requirements. So basically aircraft engines, at least let them be aware what is doable. and. The important thing of this focus is what investments need to be made in sensor and actuator technologies for aircraft engines. That's the focus here. So if they know what, what, what the state of the art of the technology is and how, how do you take it forward, the focus is where should the investments be made. And also to help the researchers and the technology developers, that would be hopefully all, that, all of you here attending the series, is to help identify what sensors and actuator technologies need to be developed. So as opposed to the approach of here is a nice sensor, why don't you use it? Well, do we really need it? And this is the kind of sensor and actuator technologies that we really need. So the efforts, so the research efforts can be focused on closing the gap between the current and the desired capability and also to help increase, understand the requirements to help transition the technology into a product. So the Overview is these are the controls of diagnostics technologies that are for the future, and what will be the sensors and actuators needed to make them happen. And the discussion we have is kind of limited to onboard intelligence. There's other another aspect of operability or maintainability from the ground. We're not looking at that. We're looking at more like technologies which is onboard the aircraft engine. Okay, all right. So. Uh, just to briefly, I think most of you should be familiar about the, the what is the challenge in aircraft engines. It's the operational environment, which is very harsh. High temperatures, pressures, and vibration, which pose real challenges for sensors and actuators. In terms of life, how long, reliability, and also volume and weight limitations. Sensors have to be small, they have to be light. You know, and then there's all this issue of connecting with power, communications. So all those, and in a real state, is very limited. It's a very harsh environment. Uh, you know, you have combustors with 2,000 plus degrees, and even the cooling air that is used to cool <laughs> the turbine blades is 650 degrees centigrade. So that's what's called cooling air. Uh, you've got to have 20,000 hours between uh, between service, so it's long life. Any sensors which needs to be on board has to have guaranteed mean time between failure of more than 20,000 hours. Um, so, and then there's vibration, there is a shaft there which has uh, vibration which produces vibration. 
So all those challenges are there. So not only do you have a challenge of being able to operate in a harsh environment with a long life and reliability, but you also have a challenge of making sure the technology is viable from an affordability perspective. So any new technology has to buy its way on the engine in terms of providing some value to the customer. Just because you have a technology doesn't mean that it will get on board. It has to be serve some purpose and be of some value to the customer. So this is the outline for the top. Then we will have uh, Wolfgang talking about, uh, uh, to adjust that, this was Hugo used to talk about this, but we now we have Wolfgang talking about this. Uh, so where various aspects of active control for gas path components. So going through the gas path, for those of you who might not be familiar with turbine engines, but you can break it up into components. Is, uh, you know, this is the this is part is supposed to be the inlet, then you have a fan, then you have a typically a two-stage compressor. One is a low speed compressor, high speed compressor, then you have the combustor, then you have a two-stage turbine, uh, uh, two low pressure turbine, high pressure turbine, low pressure turbine, and then the nozzle. So in com this is like shown as a commercial aircraft. In military engines, uh, you don't have so much of a fan. The bypass ratio, this is much less uh, in military engines. So uh, we will be looking at, starting from the beginning to the end of the components, uh, each, uh, for each of these component active control, uh, there will be a discussion of the benefits of active control and there will be an emphasis on the operational requirements for sensors and actuators to enable the active control. I'll talk about intelligent control and health monitoring, where our emphasis is on gas path health monitoring and concepts for model-based control and diagnostics. Assumption is that we are not looking at a new actuation, but it's only additional sensors and software that goes into control logic. And the paradigm shift here for intelligent control and health monitoring especially is to sh move from a schedule-based maintenance to condition-based maintenance. So right now, like it's like I give the example of a car, you know, if you have a car, they tell you, okay, change oil every 3,000 miles, basic car. You have a little more fancier car would have uh, a, a software in there which would monitor your RPM. and the condition uh, oil oil change oil light will come up depending on different operating conditions and then there's the either fancier higher luxury end cars they even have an oil sensor which basically monitors the condition of the oil and then tells you that it's time to change the oil so that's an example of moving from a schedule based maintenance to a condition based maintenance and that's the big focus in aircraft engines uh, then i will talk about um, a control architecture. A current control architecture for aircraft engines is a very centralized control architecture which poses some limitations for intelligent engines and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit and the idea is to move to a more distributed control architecture which will enable future technologies. And I'll very briefly talk about some universal sensor and actuator requirements beyond performance. How do you go about making a business case and why making a business case is very important just because you have a kind of a sensor or a kind of actuator doesn't mean it will find its way into a production engine. Then Ian will focus more on the sensor technology requirements and roadmaps. He'll talk about current and future sensor technologies, uh, generic requirements based on sensed variables. If you are sensing a pressure, what are the requirements? Uh, you put have pressure sensing for the compressor versus pressure sensing for the turbine. So you have a basically varied requirements. And the current TRL technology readiness level, this TRL term was defined by NASA. And uh, I, I don't know whether I have a TRL map in there. Uh, but TRL is termed as, one is your basic fundamental research, you have an idea. And 10 is, okay, the, your whole system is operating in real environment. So TRL 1 to 3 is meant to be like you're doing fundamental research. TRL 4 to 6 is if you're developing a concept in the lab, like for instance, if you, if you demonstrate active stall control on a rig, that means the technology is at level 6 or 7. Then you have to demonstrate it in flight. 
and then nine is when if you have a prototype which is operable in flight. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the idea of TRLs. Then we will have uh, Wolfgang and uh, uh, and uh, and Hugo will share the stuff about. Uh, the same thing, current and potential actuator technologies gener generate requirements for different actuation concepts, whether it's it's a flow control or it's a mechanical control. And then the same thing with the TRL levels and our current thinking of what some of the process, how much time the promising technologies will get to TRL 6. We'll have summary and recommendations uh, by Ian and then we'll have round table discussions uh, sitting around you know there's a nice table also we'll get your feedback uh, and some more ideas you know, on, on the thing and the format is very informal so please feel free to ask questions at any time you know so you don't have to wait till the end anytime during the discussion you can ask questions okay all right very good so thank you and next uh, i will have uh,